Part One of Maud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Maud, Prose and Verse by Christina Rossetti. Prefatory Note. This tale for girls, as I should be disposed to call it, was written out by Christina Rossetti with her usual excessive neatness of calligraphy in 1850. I suppose it may have been composed in that year, or a year or two earlier. In 1850, up to the 5th of December, she was nineteen years of age. Of the rather numerous poems interspersed in the tale, all save two have, I think, been published ere now. They were all written without any intention of inserting them in any tale, except only the first two in the trio Bou Rime sonnets. The manuscript of the tale presents a few slight revisions, made at some much later date, perhaps about 1870 or 1875. I dare say that Christina may, towards 1850, have offered the tale here or there for publication, but have no particular recollection as to that point. In now at last publishing it, I am not under any misapprehension regarding the degree of merit which it possesses. I allow it to be in all senses a juvenile performance, but I think it is agreeably written, and not without touches of genuine perception and discernment. Most of the poems I rate high. The literary reputation of Christina Rossetti is now sufficiently established to make what she wrote interesting to many persons if not for the writing's own sake, then for the writer's. As such, I feel no qualms in giving publicity to Maud. It appears to me that my sister's main object in delineating Maud was to exhibit what she regarded as defects in her own character, and in her attitude towards her social circle and her religious obligations. Maud's constantly weak health is also susceptible of a personal reference, no doubt intentional. Even so minor a point as her designing the pattern of a sofa pillow might apply to Christina herself. Maud is made the subject of many unfavourable comments, from herself and from her strict-minded authoress. The worst harm she appears to have done is that when she had written a good poem, she felt it to be good. She was also guilty of the grave sin of preferring to forego the receiving of the Eucharist when she supposed herself to be unworthy of it, and further of attending the musical services at St. Andrew's Church, Wells Street, Oxford Street, instead of invariably frequenting her parish church. If some readers opine that all this shows Christina Rossetti's mind to have been at that date overburdened with conscientious scruples of an extreme and even a wire-drawn kind, I share their opinion. One can trace in this tale that she was already an adherent of the advanced high church party in the Anglican Communion, including conventual sisterhoods. So far as my own views of right and wrong go, I cannot see that the much reprehended Maud commits a single serious fault from title page to finis. I fancy that Agnes and Mary Clifton may be, to some extent, limbed from two young ladies, Alicia and Priscilla Townsend, whom my sister knew and liked in those years. The whole family emigrated, perhaps a year or two prior to 1850, to Canterbury Settlement, New Zealand. Some surnames introduced into the tale, such as Hunt, Deverall, and Potter, were highly familiar in our household. Towards the close is a sentence, The locked book she never opened, but had it placed in Maud's coffin. Which is curious, as an unconscious prefigurement of a well-known and much-discussed incident in the life of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. With these few remarks, I commit Maud to the reader. For its prose, the indulgent reader, as our great-grandfathers used to phrase it, may be in requisition. For its verse, the discreet reader will suffice. W. M. Rossetti. London, November 1896. Part One A penny for your thoughts said Mrs. Foster, one bright July morning as she entered the sitting-room, 
with a bunch of roses in her hand and an open letter. "'A penny for your thoughts?' said she, addressing her daughter, who, surrounded by a chaos of stationery, was slipping out of sight some scrawled paper. This observation remaining unanswered, the mother, only too much accustomed to inattention, continued. "'Here is a note from your Aunt Letty. She wants us to go and pass a few days with them. You know, Tuesday is Mary's birthday, so they mean to have some young people and cannot dispense with your company.' "'Do you think of going?' said Maud at last, having locked her writing-book. "'Yes, dear. Even a short stay in the country may do you good. You have looked so pale lately. Don't you feel quite well? Tell me.' "'Oh, yes. There is not much the matter. Only I am tired and have a headache. Indeed, there is nothing at all the matter. Besides, the country may work wonders.' Half satisfied, Half uneasy, Mrs. Foster asked a few more questions, to have them all answered in the same style, vain questions, put to one who, without telling lies, was determined not to tell the truth. When once more alone, Maud resumed the occupation which her mother's entrance had interrupted. Her writing-book was neither commonplace book, album, scrapbook, nor diary. It was a compound of all these— and contained original compositions not intended for the public eye, pet extracts, extraordinary little sketches, and occasional tracts of journal. This choice collection she now proceeded to enrich with the following sonnet. Yes, I too could face death and never shrink, but it is harder to bear hated life, to strive with hands and knees weary of strife, to drag the heavy chain whose every link galls to the bone, to stand upon the brink of the deep grave, nor drowse, though it be rife with sleep, to hold with steady hand the knife, nor strike home. This is courage, as I think. Surely to suffer is more than to do, to do is quickly done, to suffer is longer and fuller of heart-sicknesses, each day's experience testifies of this. Good deeds are many, but good lives are few. Thousands taste the full cup. Who drains the lees? Having done which, she yawned, leaned back in her chair, and wondered how she should fill the time till dinner. Maud Foster was just fifteen. Small, though not positively short, she might easily be overlooked, but would not easily be forgotten. Her figure was slight and well-made, but appeared almost high-shouldered through a habitual shrugging stoop. Her features were regular and pleasing. As a child she had been very pretty, and might have continued so but for a fixed paleness, and an expression not exactly of pain, but languid and preoccupied to a painful degree. Yet even now, if at any time she became thoroughly aroused and interested, her sleepy eyes would light up with wonderful brilliancy, her cheeks glow with warm colour, her manner become animated, and drawing herself up to her full height, she would look more beautiful than ever she did as a child. So Mrs. Foster said, and so unhappily Maud knew. She also knew that people thought her clever, and that her little copies of verses were handed about and admired. Touching these same verses, it was the amazement of every one what could make her poetry so broken-hearted, as was mostly the case. Some pronounced that she wrote very foolishly about things she could not possibly understand. Some wondered if she really had any secret source of uneasiness, while some simply set her down as affected. Perhaps there was a degree of truth in all these opinions. But I have said enough. The following pages will enable my readers to form their own estimate of Maud's character— Meanwhile, let me transport them to another sitting-room, but this time it will be in the country, with a delightful garden lookout. Mary Clifton was arranging her mother's special nosegay when that lady entered. Here, my dear, I will finish doing the flowers. It is time for you to go and meet your aunt and cousin. Indeed, if you do not make haste, you will be too late. Thank you, Mamma. The flowers are nearly done. And Mary ran out of the room. 
Before long she and her sister were hurrying beneath a burning sun towards the railway station. Through having delayed their start to the very last moment, neither had found time to lay hands on a parasol, but this was little heeded by two healthy girls, full of life and spirits, and longing moreover to spy out their friends. Mary wanted one day of fifteen. Agnes was almost a year older. Both were well-grown and well-made, with fair hair, blue eyes, and fresh complexions. So far they were alike. What differences existed in other respects remains to be seen. "'How do you do, Aunt? How do you do, Maud? cried Mary, making a sudden dart forward as she discovered our friends, who, having left the station, had already made some progress along the dusty road. Then, relinquishing her aunt to Agnes, she seized upon her cousin, and was soon deep in the description of all the pleasures planned for the auspicious morrow. "'We are to do what we like in the morning. I mean, nothing particular is arranged, so I shall initiate you into all the mysteries of the place. All the cats, dogs, rabbits, pigeons, etc. Above all, I must introduce you to a pig, a special protégé of mine. That is, if you are inclined, for you look wretchedly pale. Aren't you well, dear?' "'Oh, yes, quite well, and you must show me everything. But what are we to do afterwards?' oh afterwards we are to be intensely grand all our young friends are coming and we are to play at round games you were always clever at round games and i expect to have great fun besides i have stipulated for unlimited strawberries and cream also sundry tarts are in course of preparation by the way i count on your introducing some new games among us benighted rustics you who come from dissipated london I fear I know nothing new, but will do my best. At any rate, I can preside at your toilet and assist in making you irresistible. Mary coloured and laughed, then thought no more of the pretty speech, which sounded as if carefully prepared by her polite cousin. The two made a strong contrast. One was occupied by a thousand shifting thoughts of herself, her friends, her plans, what she must do, what she would do. The other, whatever might employ her tongue, and to a certain extent her mind, had always an undercurrent of thought intent upon herself. Arrived at the house, greetings were duly and cordially performed. Also an introduction to a new and very fat baby, who received Maud's advances with a howl of intense dismay. The first day of a visit is often no very lively affair, so perhaps all parties heard the clock announce bedtime without much regret. Two. The young people were assembled in Mary's room, deep in the mysteries of the toilet. "'Here is your wreath, Maud. You must wear it for my sake, and forgive a surreptitious sprig of bay which I have introduced,' said Agnes, adjusting the last white rose, and looking affectionately at her sister and cousin. Maud was arranging Mary's long fair hair with good-natured anxiety to display it to the utmost advantage. One more spray of fuchsia. I was always sure fuchsia would make a beautiful headdress. There. Now you are perfection. Only look. Look, Agnes. Oh, I beg your pardon. Thank you. My wreath is very nice, only I have not earned the bay. Still, she did not remove it, and when placed on her hair it well became the really intellectual character of her face. Her dress was entirely white, simple and elegant. Neither she nor Agnes would wear ornaments, but left them to Mary, in whose honour the entertainment was given, and who in all other respects was arrayed like her sister. In the drawing-room Mary proceeded to set in order the presents received that morning, a handsomely bound Bible from her father, and a small prayer-book with cross and clasp from her mother, a bracelet of Maud's hair from her aunt, a Cornelian heart from Agnes, and a pocket bonbonniere from her cousin, besides pretty trifles from her little brothers. In the midst of arrangements and rearrangements, the servant entered with a large bunch of lilies from the village schoolchildren, and the announcement that Mr. and Mrs. Savage were just arrived with their six daughters. Gradually the guests assembled, young and old, pretty and plain, all alike seemingly bent on enjoying themselves, some with gifts, and all with cordial greetings for Mary for she was a general favourite. There was slim Rosanna Hunt, 
her scarf arranged with artful negligence to hide a slight protrusion of one shoulder, and sweet Magdalen Ellis habited as usual in quiet colours. Then came Jane and Alice Deverall, twins so much alike that few besides their parents knew them apart with any certainty, and their fair brother Alexis, who, had he been a girl, would have increased the confusion. There was little Ellen Potter, with a round rosy face like an apple, looking as natural and good-humoured as if, instead of a grand French governess, she had had her own parents with her like most of the other children. And then came three rather haughty-looking Miss Stantons, and pale Hannah Lindley, the orphan, and Harriet Eyre, a thought too showy in her dress. Mary, all life and spirits, hastened to introduce the newcomers to Maud, who, perfectly unembarrassed, bowed and uttered little speeches with the manner of a practised woman of the world, while the genuine, unobtrusive courtesy of Agnes did more towards making their guests comfortable than the eager good nature of her sister, or the correct breeding of her cousin. At length the preliminaries were all accomplished, every one having found a seat, or being otherwise satisfactorily disposed of. The elders of the party were grouped here and there talking and looking on, the very small children were accommodated in an adjoining apartment with a gigantic Noah's Ark, and the rest of the young people being at liberty to amuse themselves as fancy might prompt, a general appeal was made to Miss Foster for some game, novel, entertaining, and ingenious, or, as some of the more diffident hinted, easy. "'I really know nothing new,' said Maud. "'You must have played at Proverbs. What's my thought like? How do you like it?' and magic music. Or, stay, there's one thing we can try. Bourrime. What? asked Mary. Bourrime. It is very easy. Someone gives rhymes, Mamma can do that, and then everyone fills them up as they think fit. A sonnet is the best form to select, but if you wish we could try eight or even four lines. But I am certain I could not make a couplet, said Mary, laughing. Of course you would get on capitally, and Agnes might manage very well, and Magdalen can do anything. But it is quite beyond me. Do pray think of something more suited to my capacity. Indeed, I have nothing else to propose. This is very much better than mere common games. But if you will not try it, that ends the matter. And Maud leaned back in her chair. I hope, began Mary, but Agnes interposed. Suppose some of us attempt Bouy May, and you meanwhile can settle what we shall do afterwards. Who is ready to test her poetical powers? What, no one? Oh, Magdalen, pray join Maud and me. This proposal met with universal approbation, and the three girls retreated to a side table. Mary, who supplied the rhymes, exacting a promise that only one sonnet should be composed. Before the next game was fixed upon, the three following productions were submitted for judgment to the discerning public. The first was by Agnes. Would that I were a turnip white, or raven black, or miserable hack dragging a cab from left to right, or would I were the showman of a sight, or weary donkey with a laden back, or racer in a sack, or freezing traveller on an alpine height, or would I were straw-catching as I drown, a wretched landsman I who cannot swim or watching a lone vessel sink rather than writing, I would change my pink gauze for a hideous yellow satin gown with deep-cut scalloped edges and a rim. Indeed, I had no idea of the sacrifice you were making, observed Maud. You did it with such heroic equanimity. Might I, however, venture to hint that my sympathy with your sorrows would have been greater had they been expressed in metre? There's gratitude for you cried Agnes gaily. What have you to expect, Magdalen? And she went on to read her friend's sonnet. I fancy the good fairies dressed in white, glancing like moonbeams through the shadows black, without much work to do for king or hack, training perhaps some twisted branch aright, or sweeping faded autumn leaves from sight, to foster embryo life, or binding back stray tendrils, or in ample bean-pod sack bringing wild honey from the rocky height, or fishing for a fly lest it should drown, or teaching water-lily heads to swim, fearful that sudden rain might make them sink, 
or dyeing the pale rose a warmer pink, or wrapping lilies in their leafy gown, yet letting the white peep beyond the rim. Well, Maud? Well, Agnes, Miss Ellis is too kind to feel gratified at hearing that her verses make me tremble for my own. But such as they are, listen. Some ladies dress in muslin full and white, some gentlemen in cloth succinct and black, some patronize a dog-cart, some a hack, some think a painted Clarence only right. Youth is not always such a pleasing sight. Witness a man with tassels on his back, or woman in a greatcoat like a sack, towering above her sex with horrid height. If all the world were water fit to drown, there are some whom you would not teach to swim. Rather enjoying if you saw them sink, certain old ladies dressed in girlish pink, with roses and geraniums on their gowns, go to the basin, poke them o'er the rim. What a very odd sonnet! said Mary after a slight pause. But surely men don't wear tassels? Her cousin smiled. You must allow for poetical license, and I have literally seen a man in Regent Street wearing a sort of hooded cloak with one tassel. Of course every one will understand the basin to mean the one in St. James's Park. With these explanations your sonnet is comprehensible, said Mary, and Magdalen added with unaffected pleasure, and without them it was by far the best of the three. Maud now exerted herself to amuse the party, and soon proved that ability was not lacking. Game after game was proposed and played at, and her fund seemed inexhaustible, for nothing was thought too nonsensical or too noisy for the occasion. Her good humour and animation were infectious. Miss Stanton incurred forfeits with the blandest smile, Hannah Lindley blushed and dimpled as she had not done for many months, Rosanna never perceived the derangement of her scarf, little Ellen exulted in freedom from schoolroom trammels, the twins guessed each other's thoughts with marvellous facility. Magdalen laughed aloud, and even Harriet Eyre's dress looked scarcely too gay for such an entertainment. Well was it for Mrs. Clifton that the strawberries, cream, and tarts had been supplied with no niggard hand, and very meagre was the remnant left when the party broke up at a late hour. 3. Agnes and Mary were discussing the pleasures of the preceding evening as they sat over the unusually late breakfast when Maud joined them. Salutations being exchanged and refreshments supplied to the last comer, the conversation was renewed. Who did you think was the prettiest girl in the room last night? Our charming selves, of course, excepted, asked Mary. Agnes and I cannot agree on this point. Yes, said her sister. We quite agree as to mere prettiness. Only I maintain that Magdalen is infinitely more attractive than half the handsome people one sees. There is so much sense in her face, and such sweetness. Besides, her eyes are really beautiful. Miss Ellis has a characteristic countenance, but she appeared to me very far from the belle of the evening. Rosanna Hunt has much more regular features. Surely you don't think Rosanna prettier than Jane and Alice? interrupted Mary. I suppose I never look at those two without fresh pleasure. They have good fair complexions, eyes and hair, certainly. And Maud glanced rather pointedly at her unconscious cousin. But to me they have a wax dollish air which is quite unpleasant. I think one of the handsomest faces in the room was Miss Stanton's. But she has such a disagreeable expression, rejoined Mary hastily. Then, colouring, she half turned towards her sister, who looked grave, but did not speak. A pause ensued, and then Agnes said, I remember how prejudiced I felt against Miss Stanton when first she came to live here, for her appearance and manners are certainly unattractive, and how ashamed of myself I was when we heard that last year, through all the bitterly cold weather, she rose at six, though she is never a fire in her room, that she might have time before breakfast to make clothes for some of the poorest people in the village, and in the spring, when the scarlet fever was about, her mother would not let her go near the sick children for fear of contagion. So she saved up all her pocket money to buy wine and soup and such things for them as they recovered. I dare say she is very good, said Maud. 
but that does not make her pleasing besides the whole family have that disagreeable expression and i suppose they are not all paragons but you have both finished breakfast and make me ashamed by your diligence what is that beautiful piece of work the sisters looked delighted i am so glad you like it dear maud mary and i are embroidering a cover for the lectern in our church but we feared you might think the ground dull not at all i prefer those quiet shades why how well you do it is it not very difficult let me see if i understand the devices there is the cross and the crown of thorns and those must be the keys of st peter with of course the sword of st paul do the flowers mean anything i am the rose of sharon and the lily of the valley answered agnes pointing that is balm of gilead at least it is what we call so there are myrrh and hyssop and that is a palm branch the border is to be vine leaves and grapes with fig leaves at the corners thanks to mary's suggestions would you like to help us there is plenty of room at the frame no i should not do it well enough and have not time to learn as we go home to-morrow how i envy you she continued in a low voice as if speaking rather to herself than to her hearers you who live in the country and are exactly what you appear and never wish for what you do not possess i am sick of display and poetry and acting you do not act replied agnes warmly i never knew a more sincere person one difference between us is that you are less healthy and far more clever than i am and this reminds me miss savage begged me to ask you for some verses to put in her album would you be so very obliging any that you have by you would do she can have the sonnet i wrote last night agnes hesitated i could not well offer her that because why she does not tower oh i suppose she has some reprehensible old lady in her family and so might feel hurt at my lynch law i will find you something else then before i go and that evening when agnes went to her cousin's room to help her in packing maud consigned to her a neat copy of the following lines she sat and sang all way by the green margin of a stream watching the fishes leap and play beneath the glad sunbeam i sat and wept all way beneath the moon's most shadowy beam watching the blossoms of the may weep leaves into the stream i wept for memory she sang for hope that is so fair my tears were swallowed by the sea her songs died on the air end of part one